Greetings, everyone. P. Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House, our last episode of 2023 alongside Mr. Martin Popoff. Happy holidays, Martin. That's, Happy that's New Year. right. Happy holidays to you. That's right. I never I never really thought about that. So uh, do you feel all recovered from Christmas? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> I, I was just telling Martin I need a vacation from the holidays now. So thankfully, uh, my first week back at work will be fairly quiet, I think. And then it's my birthday a week from today. So that's kind of good. And I'll have that update off. So uh, yeah, I need I need some recovery time. For the holidays are too busy, Martin. It's, yeah. it's supposed to be a time to relax with friends and family. And I find it's just, it's too busy. It's too busy. Who wants to have lunch? Who wants to have dinner? Got to go shopping. Got to do more shopping. Got to do more shopping. Got to do cooking, cleaning, all that kind of stuff. Before you know it, the, 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 I mean, I've been off since the 18th of December. It's kind of like that. My wife goes to me yesterday. She goes, so you got one more day left. And I'm like, what? How is that possible? Yeah, it yeah, goes quickly. Well, yeah. Goes yeah, quick. we got all the phone calls in with the cousins. And we, walk, we went uh, on a little walk through High Park and stuff. So, uh, yeah, lot, lots of... Uh, Lots has been going on, although it's been it's been basically cold, you know, or warm and rainy here kind of thing. So same here. Yeah. yeah, it's we've we've had rain all week. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing some sun or some snow or something that's different than this. It's been like yeah. 40 to 50 temperature wise, which is a little on the warmest side and just rain every day. Rain yeah. nonstop. Yeah. It's just yeah. dreary and gray and I'm ready for something, something a little different. I, you know what? Make it, bring on the cold, bring on the snow. I don't care. I just don't want this anymore. Yeah, so. yeah. Got a lot of books for Christmas too. So catching up on my reading, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to wanted to flash a couple things here that I've been reading, and uh, and and we'll we'll mention one that we both uh, participated in at one point too. But I've been reading the uh, the the two volume Ecology of Souls: A New Myth of Death and the Paranormal by Joshua Cutchin. So got both of the. I'm into the second volume now of that. And solving the airship mystery, and I've been reading both of the books on uh, uh, the two different world fairs. This is on the Buffalo World Fair, and there's the Chicago World Fair one. So I, I actually left. Uh, I, I meant to bring the Chicago one down to to the house, but yeah, a couple uh, um, uh, things that I've gotten just recently, music related. We've got Matt's Erickson's. Uh, what did he call this? Death: The Antidote to Mi uh, to Misery. And this is actually a, a kind of like a death metal fiction book. He's he's a scientist guy um, who uh, whose last one was a, was a nonfiction book. But yeah, it's got all these death metal sort of uh, um, drawings in it as well and all these short stories. And then the other one I've been uh, really into is Jason Lamb's No Means No book. You know, I've mentioned No, no Means No on here uh, yeah. quite a bit. I, I'm loving this book and it's all getting me into all the side projects and stuff as well, like the Hanson Brothers and... Uh, what do we got? Showbiz Giants. I don't have that one here, but yeah, the, the Great Wrong album. I'm actually in this chapter right now. So reading all about these guys right now. And then, um, you know, of course, uh, you and I were both involved in uh, Tim Derling's book, Down for the Count. So uh, so this is a good read as well. If you want to go through the whole Y&T catalog, right? Yep. Learn all about that stuff. So uh, yeah, lots lots of that going on in the, in this in this rainy weather. But yeah, we've been out for a few things as well. We are you reading all thinking, those book? Are you reading all those books at the same time? Yeah, yeah, a little bit here and there, mixed in with YouTube videos and strolling through TikTok. I, I've yeah, to be Netflix. I have this weird. I, I guess my brain is starting to think like a young person, right? Where I've got about 180 seconds of uh, attention span, and then I and then I check something else. And you want to keep all the balls in the in the air going at once, kind of thing. But uh, yeah, we're gonna have some time because we're not going to a Bills game. We were gonna go down and stay overnight and go see the Bills game um, with uh, with uh, New England. But uh, my son was looking up tickets, and uh, they're like 200 bucks US. Uh, a, a ticket now so uh yeah I mean, we're, we're not gonna but yeah we've been watching just non-stop football all all through the break as well Well, i mean that's a lot of people do that thing. yeah it's i'm not a football fan but i know my dad's yeah. been you know trying to watch as much as he can and uh yeah i've been trying to read too i'm i'm like maybe three quarters of the way through tim's book which is really really fun uh i'm reading stephen king's latest book i've got the getty lee autobiography ready to go i can't wait to dive into that and i got a whole stack of other books that uh, i just finished the pete townsend autobiography i was reading an old uh pulp uh book from the 40s on the avenger the old uh kind of like superhero crime fighter guy from the uh that's kind of like palette cleanser stuff for me the avenger or doc savage and or the the shadow i like reading those old 40s kind of like 
pre superhero yeah. day type things and stuff. So yeah, but I can I can only generally read two books at a time. Otherwise, I just I forget what's going on and what yeah. you know. So I commend you for being able to juggle five or six or seven books at the same time. That's yeah, that's yeah. that's above my uh, comprehension at this point. <laughs> yeah, the Pete book is awesome. Eh? I mean, Pete, he's just such a good writer, right? He's just. I was, you know, I've read other biographies on Pete and the Who, which have all yeah. been great. I really enjoyed that a lot. And I think I learned, you know what it is, Martin? I think a good autobiography is one where you learn stuff about that person that you never heard, never knew before, even after reading multiple biographies. And of course, because it's coming from the source, right? But I really like Pete's autobiography a lot. That was probably one of the best ones I've read in years. Um, and I got done reading. I was like, wow, I, I just had a new appreciation for him uh, as a person, I guess. I always appreciate him as an artist, but as a person. And, you know, the struggles that he's gone through in his whole life, which are very normal that you talk to all sorts of people out there in the wild who go through the same things. And that's why, you know, all these all these folks, they're just real people, just like us when you when you come down to it. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Cool. So we've got a uh, an interesting topic today, uh, which. I think we're calling uh, albums chock full of ear candy, right? So what is ear candy, right? Uh, so Martin and I have been talking about this one for a couple of weeks. And, you know, we've done various shows here um, on production and production values and albums that we think that sound great. But I think this goes in a slightly different direction. And what we've done is we picked out 10 albums that we really like a lot or love a lot that utilize techniques or utilize techniques in the studio that give this pleasurable oral sense, right? Whether it's using instruments to recreate sounds or using actual sounds to recreate things that kind of make us happy and tickle our uh, senses and whatnot. So Martin, I don't know, I, I know Martin, can, I think, can explain this a little bit better than me because uh, he we went back and forth on uh, instant message and chat, uh, and, and he really laid it out. I think really, really well on kind of what this concept really is all about. Yeah. So, so we've we've <laughs> picked ten albums each uh, for Ear Candy, and it's funny. I went through this exercise. I, I could have sworn I did a history and five songs with Martin Popoff podcast episode all about Ear Candy, but and and this morning I thought, oh, I'm gonna go see what I said about it there just to check out. No episode. So I didn't even do one on this. So I, I don't know what, what I was on there, but, uh, but no, yeah. Not it, the old it, man. We think we did yeah. episodes we haven't done. <laughs> yeah. I, I, a couple of things I learned about this process. Number one, it, it, it was hard because, you know, you, you pick an album and then, and then what I noticed is the albums that I thought, oh yeah, this is a great ear candy album. This is one I, I, you know, and I got some things to say, and then you go through it, you know, actually don't find a lot. So one of the neat little kernels of knowledge I think I got from this is that, is that ear candy is so impressionable on you that you really think there's more of it there. And it turns out to be a really important little moment on that album that you always remember, which is kind of cool. So as, as you mentioned, I mean, ear candy can mean a bunch of different things. And in some of the ones uh, that I noticed here, as I, as I went through them and, you know, quickly did a check of these albums is that, um, yeah, ear candy can uh, can be a nebulous concept that goes into such things as uh, as hooks, right? Uh, hooks in songs, uh, and you know the the main kind of ear candy we usually think about is uh, is literally like sound effects or spoken word or a door slamming or something like that. But it can also move into well, that's an odd instrument or that's an odd sound or an odd effect that they put on something that causes ear candy. And and it's funny in our back and forth in in Messenger, you know, this this sort of concept came up that you you had mentioned last night about about gee, you know, but my, mine aren't particularly comedic, I think is what you said, right? So so there's a whole there's a whole sort of uh debate you can have about comedy and music and ear candy and and uh and comedy so so that's an odd one too so yeah it was it was kind of a cool exercise so uh so i'll start with my first one um my first one i picked out was max webster mutiny up my sleeve now again um yeah there you go uh so so um again you know uh coming up with these albums i kind of thought band first and then you go and you realize a, like I say, there's not as much ear candy as you think. And, and B, it, you thought it was there because it's actually sprinkled uh, across a lot of the, the band's albums, right? Yeah. Um, but this is one that really came to mind because you've got, uh, you know, 
in lip service right off the bat, not particularly an ear candy sort of song, but you've got those tune toms of Gary McCracken, and that's a form of ear candy. You've got the Hammond sounds in there as well. You've got the only your right hand knows the left hand stop start thing, right? Stop starting is a form of ear candy. Yeah. It's like, it's like, oh, where did the song go? And a guy's just singing kind of thing, right? Um, and uh, and you've got the jazz jam at the end. So that's kind of like like weird ear candy as well. Astonish Me has a ton of sounds in it. Distressed has a lot of these crazy percussion sounds. Odd guitar. Again, Terry Watkinson uh, proves to be a very ear candy. You know, and th these are things I never really thought of that much until, you know, the assignment was go look for ear candy. Right. So so I realized that that even Terry Watkinson is providing a lot of that uh you know, z zesty sort of amusing sound because of the array of things he does on keyboards. Um, uh, so yeah, there's there's cool stops and starts and syncopation and things. Uh, the party is the one that I thought immediately for ear candy because it starts off with that crowd going, the neighbors holler, this party's higher than the Eiffel Tower, and then the song kicks in, right? And then it's got those little Zappa esque things um, where there's this funny little almost like bazooki music uh, in in there. Um, there's tambourine there or sleigh bells or something. So ear candy can be added percussion elements. Uh, Hawaii's got the 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 gulls in the morning and oh it's it's morning in the sun and and stirring of the coffee thing so that's perfect pink floyd type uh, ear candy wind chimes on there um triangle there's a little japanese sort of sounding music in, in there as well um beyond the moon's got a, a true kind of bazooki music start there and that goes back to uh this this weird part of max webster history where kim mitchell was hired on to be the guitarist on some greek tour sort of thing and then pi went and joined him and pi was there so they they both have this sort of greek influence um uh and then there's this stomping and clapping in it as well and there's dive bombing synth sounds um so yeah Ma max webster you definitely think of that you think of the car horns on million vacations you think of toronto tontos with that weird little part in there so this is a band that uh that you know routinely or regularly but not continually wakes you up with these perky little sounds where you go oh that's uh they're adding interest to the thing so there you go first one so uh you know in, in getting ready for this exercise i decided that i wanted to re-listen to all of my picks on headphones i other than like at the gym all right i very rarely listen to music on headphones but i felt it was important to do so for this uh and i do want to mention because some people might ask in the comments like well what's the difference between ear candy and an ear worm and i think the ear candy are all the little elements that could create possibly an ear worm although ear worms i think are more akin to hook those hooks and melodies that you were talking about at the beginning right but the ear candy could support those right so uh so I, I found this difficult, um, but I think in the end, I'm very happy with my choices, and I think they all represent exactly what we're talking about. So my first choice could be the granddaddy of all of them on here for me, and that's uh, Electric Ladyland by Jimi Hendrix. So 1968 is third album. So this, to me, Jimmy in the studio used the studio to create all this wonderful ear candy. There's just so much going on in this album. And again, this is one of those albums, I think, to, to best experience all the little ear candy pieces is to listen to it on headphones. I mean, it starts off right off the bat and God's Made Love has all these weird sound effects. Very, very trippy, totally psychedelic. Uh, Have You Ever Been to Electric Ladyland has all these cool use of vocal layers and effects on the guitars. And I, I instantly thought of Prince when I was re-listening to this. I'm like, my God, you know, obviously we knew Prince was a big Hendrix fan. Frosttown Traffic has this great use of stereo panning, left and right channel. And I'm just like, holy cow, you know, and re-listening to this on headphones, an album that I haven't listened to on headphones in, in forever, um, you know, Voodoo Child using like the wah and the fuzz as a totally separate way of delivering uh, the sound. Uh, Gypsy Eyes has all these multi-track guitars going all over the place. Um, Burning in the Midnight Lamp has sitar-like sounds and wah-wah, you know, wah, 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 making like these water sounds, which I think is really, really cool. Um, Rainy Day, Dream Away has got this sax and organ and guitars doing this whole call and response thing, which I think is cool. Uh, 1983, A Merman I Should Turn to Be has these interesting like guitars making like ocean sounds. Right, which is pretty cool. And then on the flip side, you got Moon Turn the Tides. 
using the guitar to create space sounds, what it would sound like on the moon or something like that. Um, and, you know, really great use of stereo panning, still raining, still dreaming. Again, has the Wawa panned left and right, really cool experience. And then you got all on the Watchtower, of course, which has a nice way of layering acoustic guitars and electric guitars throughout the song. And then on the guitar solo, it's got this backwards, uh, you know, technique which again gives like this kind of liquidy type sound i mean i think like this is a perfect example like every song has all this stuff going on uh that sonically makes it chock full of what we're calling the ear candy here so electric lady lamp nice and and in a in a macro sense i mean the the whole the whole idea of psych the first thing you think about when you think of psych is ear candy it's basically yeah. You know, pretty much yeah well the, the the songs are more complex too versus the previous era which would have been garage i suppose garage and the beatles it's almost like there's two genres before psych garage and the beatles yeah uh, for sure yeah i mean the beatles but, and we could have picked any beatles album really for this i i decided not to yeah. because there's just too many of them but yeah for sure that that's actually a good point because you know when you think of uh when you think of uh you know the, this amusing thing we always say is like beatles did everything first it's like beatles kind of did ear candy first too they're, yes. they're like the big ear candy band right so yeah here's yeah. another thing i learned from this exercise um uh I, I almost I was going through albums I was going to pick and I go, geez, these are mostly my favorite albums of all time. And then I'm thinking, what does that mean? Does, does it mean I need ear candy on my favorite albums of all time? And I almost rose to the challenge of, of trying to make all 10 of them, 10 of my favorite albums of all time. And, and you know, I, I think over half of these are, um, you know, in my top 20 kind of thing. Um, and this one, this one totally fits. So I went with Peter Gabriel Melt um for an ear candy album and this one is uh uh is again chock full of it almost in the jimmy way in that in that um he, he uh you know he he's essentially making lots of ear candy using regular instruments sort of thing um yeah. you know it's not car door slamming and stuff like that but intruder you know it, immediately you've got those big dated uh pioneering drums uh the the gated the gated drums uh you got the creaking door sound uh right um the vocal yelping and the whispering and stuff. So, so Peter Gabriel is, is actually creating ear candy just with a, a variety of voices, right? Using the voice as an instrument, no self-control. You've got the looping, uh, the, the loop sort of frippy stuff. Um, so, so, um, you, you actually get guitar being played in a different way, and it sounds like ear candy. It sounds like a sound rather than a guitar. Uh, you've got the, the looped marimba lines. You've got uh, odd percussion instruments in there as well. Uh, the vocals in the background. Start uh, has this distant vocal. You've got the sax with reverb. So you can introduce instruments that you don't expect, and that becomes a, a form of ear candy. Um, I don't remember has the weird bellowing going on the fretless bass um the synth sounds larry fast um th through the wires got tambourine on it games without frontiers uh you've got the the iconic Je sans frontier um you know the 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 female vocal thing in there as well the guitar tones in there the percussion um not one of us again strange vocals as instrument in that uh, lead a normal life. We're back to a, a looping sort of marimba line in that one. Biko, you've got the big drum beat, the the uh, African women singing thing, uh, the marching kind of African drums. And then at the end, it, it fades away and it's just the African singing on its own. So that's a that's a true, you know, use of ear candy in the in the Pink Floyd sense of it sort of thing. And that one obviously relates to a famous Pink Floyd song uh, as well that does sort of the same thing. So, yeah. This is a this is definitely an album where um, you know people think of it as an audio experience and and an audio or headphone experience uh, that's full of ear candy, but it's uh, it it's kind of cool that that most of the ear candy on it is uh, is a, is a select bunch of things done over and over again that are completely weird uh, to hear, and that's why this is such an iconic pioneering album. Yeah, go. that's a that's a great choice. Um... Yeah, there's so much going on in that album. And, and I think a, a lot of these albums are going to be great examples of where, like you mentioned, you can use techniques in the studios to kind of create all this stuff uh, and even utilize normal traditional rock instruments to make it sound like otherworldly. I mean, some of these will have all sorts of other things at play, but like, but I think like something like my next choice is a perfect example of utilizing 
like a power trio and making it sound really lush and cool and psychedelic. And it's a uh, bridge of size by Robin Trower, which is mm. that man, maybe right there uh, from 1973, his second album. So here uh, we got Matthew, Matthew Fisher producing this album. Of course, his former um, uh, co-member in uh, Procol Harum. So, I mean, the title track, you know, we got, it, it, it starts off with um, Day of the Eagle, which is just a, your standard kind of heavy bluesy rock song. But then as soon as that song finishes and we segue into the title track, you've got, you know, all these kind of wind effects and chimes and then the guitar comes in and the guitar itself has like these, uh, you know, phaser univibe effects going on right there. Um, and then, Moving into the next song in this place again, you've got these kind of like shimmering chords, and then using wah wah on the guitar and reverb in the studio creates this kind of like otherworldly, kind of like dreamy atmosphere, which I think is really, really good. Uh, you know, songs like Two Rolling Stone really, really funky. You got the wah wah again, these really nicely produced, groovy drums. You got the cool clapping, right on the outro and then the wah wah coming in with the claps it's really cool these little voices added to the outro solo which just kind of it just gives it this this feeling of like distance right so you got the claps and the little vocal things and wah and the wah wah on the guitar and it starts to fade and fade and fade almost as if he's playing the guitar walking through a crowd of people and walking away and walking away till you almost don't hear him anymore. Very, very cool. Um, and I think the production on this album is absolutely outstanding. Again, I listened to it on headphones last night and I'm like, man, this is such a great choice. And it's, it's like some of these albums I think were made to be listened to that way because you pick up on things that you may not, if you're just kind of putting it in a CD player and kind of hanging around the house or listen to it outside or whatever. But uh, yeah, you, this is a great example of using natural sounds plus all these effects on things like guitars and drums and bass, because really that's all it is. No keyboards on here, nothing like that. It's just, uh, you know, phaser, univibe, fuzz, wah-wah, reverb, and then adding all that onto the band's performance. So, yeah, bridge of size. Nice. So, yeah, he's, <clears throat> he's risen to the challenge of not making it about bells and whistles sort of thing, but let's do let's do a subtle version of that with, with what we've got kind of thing. So, yeah. Very cool. All right. My next choice again falls into the category of one of my favorite albums of all time, Culture yeah. Source Erectus. I mean, we did a Contrarians episode where I called Mirrors my favorite album. It could be this one, it could be Fire of Unknown Origin. Um, but yeah, there's this is a band who's known for some ear candy, but again, same thing, not not as much as you sort of think. Um I, I thought of this one immediately because of Black Blade with the uh, with the jet sound thing that that kicks it off, you know, uh, the the two channel thing. You've got the syncopated jam in it as well. Um, the the um, repeating sort of looped um, uh, clipped synthesizer part. So Alan Lanier does some really interesting things on synthesizer over the years. Uh, you notice, and again, it's kind of the Terry Watkinson effect where it's like, um, you know, I never really thought of this again before this exercise or, or before, before this exercise. Um, but you know, in, in a way it, it, uh, it falls upon the keyboardist to, uh, to be the, uh, the main ear candy guy in a lot of these bands, right. Kind of thing. So it's got kind of interesting. Um, you've got the blowing wind sound in it. You've got the cyborg voice part, a voice box sort of part at the end. Uh, monsters is a famous ear candy song for the little jazz jam in it, in this, in this, you know, uncommonly heavy song for blue oyster cult. Um, You've got the fast part in it as well that that reminds you of 21st century schizoid man, 20th century, 21st, whatever, whatever. Um, Marshall Plan, the crowd noise, um, the Don Kirshner, uh, you know, uh, this is Don Kirshner's rock concert. So that's that's uh, true ear candy in the in the Pink Floyd sense again, uh, that that's in there. You've got the little smoke on the water quote, you know, that perks your ear up uh, on guitar. Hungry Boys, you've got the electronic sort of asteroids uh, drum part uh sort of going on in there with a do 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 you know that's just chucked in there and again you know when you hear this ear candy stuff in here um what it makes you think is uh is like oh they're working hard they're uh, they're adding little details they're they're keeping you interested they really like their job sort of thing um so so you feel that with uh with bluish occult when they're making these albums um Fallen Angels has a synth solo, so that's a, a form of ear candy as well. It's just putting something a little bit different in there. And then Unknown Tongue has uh, the end monster bit, reveal to me, reveal to me, that thing going on in it as well. So so little bits, really classy, um, not overdoing it sort of thing, integrated into what's going on, uh, just looking for... Uh, 
you know, it, it, exciting, spicy, zesty sounds uh, to, to stick in uh, stick in these records. So there you go. Cult Source of Records. Would you say, Martin, that Martin Birch is probably not a producer that does a lot of this ear candy type stuff, but yet that is the poster child for an album produced by him that has all those elements. Exactly. Yeah. And you do get some on Fire of <laughs> Unknown Origin, but uh, yeah, you know, um, Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules and White Snake albums, not not a lot of ear candy, I don't think, yeah. on, on too many of those. And Bloors to Cults, funny. Um, e- even those early albums, which you think of as being really rudimentary, there is ear candy in there as well, like the music box and stuff like that. So as you go through the whole thing, you'll 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 find you'll find a a, a bit of it throughout the catalog. But uh, yeah, that's true about Martin Birch for sure. All right, from 1973, Quadrophenia by the Who, double album. Uh, again, an, another record that to really appreciate all the little air candidates going on here, you got to listen to on headphones, uh, which I did. Um, I am the C actually uses sea and thunder sounds right uh it's amazing how much of that is all throughout this uh this album which is really really cool uh you have on the real me you got the, the use of horns again some different elements going on a who record here i think for the first time um on the title track you've got more horns and the synths give it an orchestral feel in fact it, what's really interesting about this album martin it's like the, the listening to it on headphones for the first time in a while um this almost sounds like big band who at times the way it's produced, you know, you got the use of the horns and the synthesizers. And I love the way that Keith Moon's drumming is produced on here. It's almost like uh, if you ever listen to like old big band or old jazz uh, stuff with really with a notable drummer like Art Blakey or a Krupa or um, yeah, Buddy Rich or whatever, the drums are really spotlighted in the mix uh and like whenever he does like these little fills it's like he's so prevalent and cr- crystal clear in the mix almost like you listen to him you almost feel like there's a spotlight on keith and he's doing his little thing and it's almost it's like it's like an old like jazz or big band style spotlight and they d- use that throughout this album really really well and i don't think they ever really did that with keith's drumming on any other productions uh almost like a dr- drum in an orchestra type of thing which is really cool. Uh, the Punk and the Godfather has that great use of like shimmering acoustic guitars over power chord, you know, electric guitars, which I think is something that, that uh, Pete always did really, really well, but it's very spotlighted on this album really nicely. Uh, 515 has horns working with the piano, again, giving it that orchestral feel. And then, uh, you know, on Sea and Sand, you've got beach and ocean sounds, which then also pop up again on Love Rain Over Me, along with the rain and the thunder and all that kind of stuff. So this whole like kind of water, ocean, storm, rain thing like permeates this whole album. And it gives it, I mean, there's no other Who album that sounds like this. And again, I know it's part of the concept and everything like that. I mean, you even see, you know, the water on the album and all that kind of stuff. But I think it works really, really well. And it makes this out of all the Who albums. You know, you could argue this some of this on Who's Next uh, and maybe even on Tommy. But I think it really is utilized to perfection on this album. So yeah, Quadrophenia. Wicked, nice choice. Yeah, there's all those stories of Pete going out and doing it in himself and all that stuff. And yeah, yeah. yeah very cool. <laughs> okay, my next choice is um again one of my favorite albums of all time, maybe my favorite at, at certain times, Led Zeppelin Physical Graffiti. Um, and it's funny, I, I go through this one and I go, Wow, that the ear candy on here is is definitely more of the musical type. Um, but you know, it it comes up periodically and you always remember it. You always think of it sort of thing. Custard pie immediately. You've got the clavinet sound in there. Um, so that, that's like, Oh, what, what is that? It, it, it literally defines the song. Uh, in my time of dying, you've got the, uh, the true ear candy at the end of, uh, can you get that airplane out of here? Cough, do, 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 do. you know, that whole, the, the whole thing, you got this massive epic, maybe the greatest Zeppelin song of all time, arguably. Um, and then they undermine it with this, uh, with this little sort of funny moment at the end, uh, house of the Holy's got cowbell in it trampled underfoot. You've got, you got major clavinet sort of sound in there. Yeah. Um, Cashmere uh, has the ear candy of the strings uh, and the phase shifter stuff as well. So those are little things added in the light. You've got the spacey synth intro sound. Uh, it's very church organy sounding. Um, so again, yeah, kind of interesting. Um, I, I guess this goes along that theme of a, it's like, you know, Mr. Keyboardist, John Paul, you, you've got to, you've got to keep people interested in this band. Uh, find some interesting sounds for us kind of thing. Right. Um, 
Bronyar, instrumental, instrumental itself, and a short song in itself is a type of ear candy, right? Um, it's for shortest att attention spans. Ear candy is something that's for, uh, you know, you know, impress me sort of thing. Something that that can impress anybody super in, uh, easily, right? And short songs kind of feel like ear candy uh, in that you know conceptually as well down by the sea uh seaside you've got the slide guitar watery effect sort of thing uh night flight the ending grunts and the stops and starts so stops and starts is is always you know that word amusing right amusing ear candy they kind of go together right um wanton song again is major with the stops and starts the pregnant pauses as i sometimes call them Boogie with Stu, just being this sort of funny saloon music, right? You know, con country production on it and the and the barrel house sort of piano thing. And that's again amusing, right? It's it's funny, it's it's a little bit comedic. Uh black country woman being complete bluegrass is is a type of ear candy. And sick again with the weird slidey closeout <laughs> thing. Uh Bonham uh can 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 be a guy, and here's a good example where he can create ear candy on drums as well. You and I have often talked about how Bonham is one of the few drummers, you know, capable or, or he's lauded for it, put it this way of creating hooks on the drums. Right. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's the, it's that, it's that continuum between hooks and ear candy. <clears throat> so again, um, you know, going through this album, it's like, Oh, do I have enough ear candy here sort of thing? And then it just keeps coming up, but it's all conservative ear candy. Well, I mean, the when you really come down to it, the the variety on that album is the ear candy itself. It's like from Good track point. to track, yep. you get something completely different, and that and that's yep. the reason why I love that album so much because you get yep. you have everything that Led Zeppelin has in their repertoire, and then some on that album, from track to track. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Next up uh, from 1977, the debut solo album from Anthony Phillips, "Geese and the Ghost," the Geese and the Ghost. Uh, this to me was another really interesting pick because this is such a lush album that just filled the whole album is ear candy. Uh, you know, this is not a rock album per se. This is more a kind of, uh, you know, pastoral folky progressive rock meets classical type of thing. Uh, this is first album after leaving Genesis here. We've got, um, you know, Mellotron creating wind noises and this kind of feeling of, uh, you know, the landscape sort of thing. You got these lush acoustic guitars all over the album. He's using harmonium and piano and other different types of keyboards to create these sounds that uh, almost make you think of like running brooks and streams, right? Because I mean, I mean, the cover art is perfectly exemplifies just what this album sounds like. It's like someone sitting looking over the forest and the fields and there's streams and animals all around that type of thing. Uh, you've got violins and cellos and oboe and flute um and again just in delivered in like a whimsical way that it's just very very pleasing on the ears and you know if you look at like the uh the list of musicians and all the instruments that anthony played on this album it's just it's ridiculous how much stuff is on here so you're getting that kind of ear candy every step of the way throughout each and every track um very very pastoral <clears throat> every song you're you're thinking of again farmlands nature livestock um you know animals out in the wild fish in the in the stream in the brook that sort of thing and i think uh the way they're utilizing all these instruments just conveys that whole thing the whole album is like that you feel like this is something you should be listening to sitting outside on a bright sunny day with no distraction no noises of cars or anything like that you're a mile away from everything else martin and all you hear is this album and it perfectly kind of traps you in this atmosphere or this kind of place that you're in which should be right there you got the little minstrel guy sitting there overlooking the, the stream and that's it's just yeah. the, it's exactly how you feel when you listen to this and again i hadn't heard this in a long time and i played it yesterday on headphones and i'm like holy cow i'm in i'm in that spot right there and that's yeah. a good job that's a job well done i think nice nice all right, this is the part of the show where I try to speed things up a little because I've been yapping too long. I don't want to keep you forever. So uh, I'll, I'll try to go a little, little faster. Um, 
Next is ZZ Top de Guayo. Um, I feel like this is a good ear candy band. Uh, and this album doesn't have a ton of it, but she loves my automobile. You get the horns, um, you know, so the horns, they went and learned the horns and that becomes ear candy on these albums. Oh, it's just an extra little element to listen to. And vocals. I mean, this is a band that that creates ear candy with with their vocals. Billy, Billy Gibbons has various gears that he uses, uh, you know, uh, Dusty Hill as well. Same sort of thing. Um, I'm Bad I'm Nationwide shows the band um, creating ear candy. Billy Gibbons creates a lot of ear candy with the, with his his variety of guitar tones. Uh, so that's kind of a cool thing as well. Uh, and why I thought of this album instinctually is, is, again, that idea of, like you said, go back to the headphones. It's a real headphone headphones album there's so many interesting production things going on uh but manic mechanic is is probably the best for it. it's got the car sounds and the uh and the uh treated mechanics sort of voice on there and the spoken word um hi-fi mama horn arrangement as well cheap sunglasses the the woo woo sound that goes on in that that's that's definitely uh ear candy um you know at, uh, applied um it makes it a hit. It help it it helps people. Uh, puts a smile on their face when they're listening to this song. It it just takes it out of the realm of being a regular sort of song. It's just amusing and a little bit funny. Um, the clean guitars on it as well, and then the famous Esther be the one with that whip cracking sound or or uh, whatever it is like gun going off or whatever. Because uh, it's yeah, shoots a machine. It, it always sounded like a whip whip cracking to me, right? But uh, tambourine in there. There's bell cymbal riding at the end. So so little bits throughout. And again, this is a band that that does a little bit throughout the catalog. But uh, I guess if we were to pick a theme with ZZ Top, I'd say they're a great band for creating ear candy with their with their various vocals their vocals can be truly amusing and then and then being uh very audio file with uh with the guitar sounds yeah i mean he is a master of just with his guitar <clears throat> using like harmonics and fuzz and feedback and slide to to come up with all these cool little noises and things which are so yeah. so billy gibbons yeah it's a great pick all right so i'm gonna pick now a band that you wouldn't think has ear candy on any of their albums but for sure, they have them on at least one, and that is uh, Kiss Destroyer from 1976, produced by Bob Ezrin. I remember as a kid listening to this and thinking, wow, this sounds really different than what I know and love on Kiss Alive, right? This is totally different. Uh, this is Kiss finally having a really top-notch producer who's willing to do some interesting things. You know, Detroit Rock City, of course, starts off, you got the newsreel audio, right? You got the car noises, you got the crash at the end, right? You got the nice use of reverb on uh, King of the Nighttime World. You got echo effects and little child talking vocalization things on God of Thunder. Gives it that kind of like real like apocalyptic doomy feel. Great Expectations has like strings and a big choir, right? You got the multi-track vocals and the piano on Shout It Out Loud. Again, this is none of the stuff that Kiss we would ever think Kiss would use, right? Uh, strings and piano on Beth. Right. I think uh, Bob Ezrin totally makes this a different sounding kiss on this record. It's lush. It's filled with ear candy. Some people nowadays looking back might not like that. Maybe this isn't a traditional kiss sounding record, but, you know, we can't deny the songs are really, really good and they just sound so different. So, yeah, this is ear candy kiss, maybe never to be uh, replicated, maybe save for the elder, I guess, a little bit. But this to me is a great sounding album with all this kind of cool stuff that we're talking about. Nice. All right. My next choice, again, one of my favorite albums of all time, my favorite David Bowie album, definitely Scary Monsters. Um, this is a true ear candy album for me. I mean, it kicks off right immediately with It's No Game with the with the tape machine sound. Um, and you've got the Japanese female talking um, thing going on as well, which is very distinctive. It's high up in the mix. It's, it's really cool. Um, you got the weird frippy sort of guitar, uh, the shut ups at the end, you know, shut up, you know, that that whole thing. So it, so the first song is chock full of, uh, of ear candy uh, up the hill backwards. It's got the tambourine in there and the triangle thing going on. The weird, the weird sort of stacked singing in there. Scary Monsters has that that weird uh, descending sort of sound, you know, ding, 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 you know, that thing in it. Um, so yeah, just literally the definition of ear candy. You've got this rocking song going along, almost like a punky new wave so song, uh, but you've got this uh, this this sort of you know weird sound from David Bowie's kind of weird 
you know, uh, weird sound creating past with the Berlin thing and then into post-punk. Uh, and post-punk is something that was very, um, you know, influenced by that Berlin years uh, Bowie thing. And again, we're seeing we're seeing this this album kind of lines up with the Peter Gabriel album as well, where they're pioneering uh, the use of regular instruments and and and, you know, putting weird electricity through things to see what what sort of happens. Uh, Ashes to Ashes has the plinky piano in it, and the bass pull offs. Um, Fashion's got the weird breathing sound intro. Um, and again, uh, sci-fi frippy sort of guitar screams like a baby. You've got that vocal speeding up and slowing down simultaneously, uh, simultaneous effect, which is, you know, it's a very speed thing where he's trying to get like a split personality. So one voice is going up, one voice is going down. Um, and it's no game too. Uh, you've got at the end, you've got the tape spinning off. Uh, at the end, uh, it's similar to how the album begins. So it's a tape reel, and you hear that you hear the tape going off, which is which is kind of cool, and it slows to a halt, sort of thing. So yeah, good good ear candy album, just an amazing album. Period. Uh, but this is a mix of sound effecty things and uh, and a lot of the sort of stuff we talked about on the Peter Gabriel album. Yeah, and I love all the little things that Fripp does on the album on and off, right? So the, the Fripp factor is always a little bit of ear candy as well. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to make Anthony Ferraro very happy here, and I'm going to make Louis Nasser miserable, but I'm going to pick John Anderson, Elias of Sun Hillow from 1976's first solo album here. Uh, this is uh, kind of like the, the Anthony Phillips. This is yeah. chock full of ear candy every step of the way. Uh, here you got John basically playing everything on the album, and he's using natural sound effects, along with things like uh, different types of percussion and chimes and gong and marimba and woodblock and vibes and mellotron and moog, different kinds of guitars, both acoustic and electric. You got Irish harp on here and sitar and all sorts of other stuff. Every song is just layered with all these things. And you're just, you're almost like left guessing, like kind of like, well, what is that? You know, what did I just hear there? Um, and he also multi-tracks the, the voices all throughout the, the album. And you, you have these multi-track vocals, then you got wind effects and water, other nature sounds permeating the whole thing. Um, you know, Ocean Song is a perfect example of utilizing all these different techniques. It's really good. Uh, Solid Space and especially the lengthy Moon Ra, I think, is really good. It's got this kind of like wishy-washy, dreamy thing and using keyboards. And then you got like mandolin and harp and just every every turn you take on here that he's using everything but and the kitchen sink i shouldn't say but the kitchen sink martin everything and the kitchen sink is utilized to perfection on this album uh you know to some it may be a little too dreamy maybe there's too much ear candy here but i think uh you know for a guy who's mainly known as a singer he basically said i'm going to use whatever i have at my disposal to create this really lush sounding otherworldly record that sort of sounds like a yes record but sort of not it's it's totally all john anderson and i think uh Based on what we know about how he writes his lyrics, I think the musical uh, arrangements on this album are a perfect accompaniment to those lyrics. So, yeah, Elias of Sun. Nice. All right. Uh, my next choice again, uh, possibly one of my favorite albums of all time. I mean, I picked it as number one before um, Black Sabbath Sabotage. Um, so, yeah, Sabbath fairly ear candy uh type band um not not crazy um but on this one they've definitely got some things hole in the skies got uh got a count in um you know, with the sticks and stuff, and then it gets going, and then it's really, really not particularly ear candy. Don't start too late on its own is ear candy. It's just this weird little, um, you know, otherworldly, frantic little Spanish guitar piece. It's short, um, but yeah, it's it's complete ear candy on its own. Uh, the symptom of the universe riff is ear candy uh, in itself uh, because it's played in the in that naked style when it kicks in. Even that transition from "Don't Start Too Late" to the riff is is a form of ear candy as well. It's it's a little bit uh, except fast as a shark, uh, which is ear candy on its own. Right. Uh, you know, with the with the needles, um, you know, scratching over the record. Um, and then uh, the Santana sort of jam at the end of Symptom of the Universe is is a form of ear candy. It's like, well, why are they doing this? It's kind of a little amusing. Right. It's a little weird. Um, Megalomania has got this languid intro, which has got that whole rhyme of the ancient Mariner feel. Um, so it's a little soundtracky. And as we've seen, Pete, with a lot of your choices, sound, sound, a soundtrack world 
uh, is uh, or a concept album soundtrack world is the is the perfect inviting place to have lots of ear candy. So this song is like a concept album on its own. It's got sound effects. It's got the psyche stuff at the end. Uh, and then, of course, the big ear candy song on here is Super Czar. Uh, the whole thing is ear candy. Yeah. Triangle bells, the chants, the marching drums, the classical structure of the thing. It's just it's just like literally it's a song about ear candy. Um and then uh, and am I going insane? It's got the screaming baby thing that the la the laughing. Um, but yeah, at the end, it's it's like, you know, the Aussies baby thing. Oh, I creeped us all out the studio kind of story. Right. Uh, <laughs> where you've got that transition of that, you know, exorcist baby uh, as as it's sort of uh, described uh, going into uh, the writ and the, and the writ itself, the bubbling bass uh, sound on there is a form of ear candy. And then they wrap it all up with blow in the jug at the end <laughs> of the song right which is which is just like it takes you back to that in my time of dying thing almost like this this weird little thing stuck on at the end but they they do this little uh i want you to blow on a jug song that was really quiet in the sonics and only available on some versions of of sabotage sometimes it was cut off um so yeah start to finish literally start to finish uh the count in our hole of the sky to blow on the jug there's there's a, a fair bit of uh, regularly appearing ear candy on Sabotage. Yeah, I mean, that's a great pick to me. That's if you're going to pick a Sabbath album for this, that's the one. You know, you can you can make an argument that Sabbath Bloody Sabbath has a little bit in volume four, but I think Sabotage is just chock full of them. Good yeah. choice. All right. Next up, uh, Martin's favorite band, Chicago, Chicago Seven, right. seventh album, 1974. Another double album. Gee, who would have thought, Martin? <laughs> The band that uh, wrote the book on how to do double albums. Uh, this is, you know, I wanted to pick a Chicago album, but and I almost picked Chicago three, but I think it just it just made more sense. This album to me is much more the kind of audiophile experience with filled with in ear candy. So here uh, again, a double album. They basically did like one album's worth of more jazz oriented stuff and then another album of more of their kind of rock and R&B flavored stuff. Uh, a lot more jazz elements here than they usually use they got mellotron on here lots more flute especially on the jazz part of this uh and a lot more percussion a lot of it kind of latin style percussion you mentioned santana before on your last pick uh, a little bit of that here as well you got prelude to air which is really intoxicating lots of chimes and percussion uh on devil suite you know got some drum solos going on there which you don't normally hear uh, again mixing with the guitar and the horns you got uh, an italian from new york city uh, making or Italian from New York, not New York City, uh, making cool use of Moog synthesizer and ARP, adding these kind of like radio dial sounds, you know, which is kind of interesting. Sounds like someone just kind of going through the dial on an old radio, which they use again on Hanky Panky as well. Uh, you've got uh, the hit on the album I've been searching so long has this really cool use of strings and uh, guitars with flanger on it. So it's kind of like this dreamy thing going on. Uh, Song of the Evergreens is another one that uses kind of dreamy effects on the keys and the guitars that mimic kind of like wind sounds, you know. Uh, this whole album is just really dreamy and cool sounding using all these cool effects in the studio, whether they be natural effects or regular instruments creating those natural effects, which I think works really well. So yeah, Chicago 7. Nice. It's funny you mentioned that because I almost went with the Clash London calling, right? Remember we we talked about at one point, uh, we should mention Chicago and the Clash in every single show we do from now on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I almost went through that one and I thought, ah, oh, how much is there on here? And then I thought, I don't want to go through another double album sort of thing and check check every song kind of thing. But yeah, that, that, one, that one almost came up for me. But uh, instead, uh, completely different band from the Clash, uh, the Tubes. Oh, good choice. Um, the debut tubes album love this uh love this album we did that cool episode on the tubes remember that was a lot of fun um but yeah this is a band uh where you get into this uh this whole debate about comedy and rock uh but but oddly enough uh on this album it's uh i mean it is comedic and it and it is a little bit of that uh that 70s Cheech and Chong, Fire Sign Theater, National Lampoon sort of comedy on here. Zappa. So Tubes is almost like, you know, how we talk about them as being kind of a Zappa-esque 
sort of band early mm. on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, up from the deep, you've got the female vocals on there. You've got the spoken word, foreign language stuff, Japanese. You got the sitar strings. Um, so that's the other thing about this band. They 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 wanted to be very, um, you know, to to I suppose somewhat to counter the uh, the uh, absurdity and inanity of the band. Um, they countered with being very high fidelity and kind of steely Danish at, at times as well. Uh, and, you know, with very good playing and stuff. So um, halos has strings that sound like Mellotron on their synthesizer space. Baby has this choral arrangement thing at the end. Uh, Malaguena, Salarosa, Mexican music, castanets. Um, and there's some Mexican in there again, or, or some, some Spanish spoken word um, stuff as well. Mondo bondage. You've got the synths, clavinet sound in there. Um, it's kind of like this weird, furious classical music at the end. Um, so, yeah, they're constantly challenging the listener with uh, with interesting sounds and things from other cultures and things from other types of music that you don't expect in a in a crazy drugged out hippie band uh, kind of thing. Right. Um, what do you want from life is a famous one for ear candy with that yeah. list at the end with a baby's arm holding an apple, right? That whole thing at the end, uh, the little, the little rock and roll sha na na part in there. Right. So again, pastiching in all these different styles of music as ear candy, the funky sort of percolating synthesizer in there. So again, this theme we're sort of discovering, Hey, it's up to you, Mr. Keyboardist to provide ear candy sounds uh, in this band. Um, and then white punks on dope. You've got the weird synthesizer in there. The lyrics themselves are ear candy. So you can have amusing, you know, Cheech and Chongy sort of lyrics uh, that are, that are ear candy in themselves. Um, you've got the echo vocals, the, the uh, sort of furious uh, you know, frantic chorus things, the synth, they got these piercing sounds there again. There's a jam. There's that heaven part with the clouds open up and ah, oh, white punks on dope. That whole thing is ear candy and just a very theatrical ending. And then with a toilet flushing uh, backstage and everybody's that. laughing kind of thing. Right. And then you get that foreign language thing in again. So they, they completely end it. Um, I, I suppose just like the Black Sabbath and the Led Zeppelin, they end it with uh, with like literally almost like a soundtracky Pink Floyd uh, flourish of ear candy. So there you go, Tubes debut album. You know, it's funny. Every time we bring up the Tubes on this show, I I keep going back to requests that we get all the time to do more shows on underrated bands, and I, to me, the Tubes are always at the top of the list when you talk about bands that did some just cool shit over the years that just. Yeah. You know, they had some success, but they're not a band that everybody talks about all the time. And I think, uh, you know, maybe they're a little misunderstood because they were a little kind of left field and a little weird. But, you know, the more you talk about albums like that and, you know, any of their other albums, I'm thinking, man, that's a band that should have gotten should have been more popular, should have, should have done more. Right. And just, just don't get enough recognition. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. Just one. Kind of three weird phases too, right? This, yeah. this intro phase, the sort of the poppy pert hard rock and new wave phase. And then, and then they kind of got funky later on. And yeah. then they mixed in a lot of like, like not very commercial stuff in with those later albums. So I always think of them as three phases kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. All really good though. All right, so my next choice for me was was fairly obvious. I wanted to bring this one up because to me, this is I always thought this is an ear candy album, and that's uh, Pink Floyd Animals from 1977. I mean, you know, we don't need to spend too much time on this because I think everybody knows what the ear candy is, but you got animal noises on here. You got the cool use of vocoder, the vocoder effects. You got the talk box that David Gilmore is using. You got, and again, I, I have to stress how much for me, layering acoustic and electric guitars and songs is such a great form of ear candy. And, and David did it marvelously on this album. Uh, you got great use of, you know, Oregon and Moog and Fender Rhodes, electric piano and ARP and more different kind of keyboards from Mr. Wright, which I think is really well done. And then I like the use of like all these little voices that pop up throughout the album. Uh, and then you've got like these echo and reverb effects on both Roger and Dave's vocals, these haunting kind of like echoed vocal effects, which are used so well. I mean, to me, a lot of the Pink Floyd albums have lots of ear candy. We could we could do a whole episode just on the ear candy on Pink Floyd albums. But I think for me, it's used the best on this album, which is my favorite Pink Floyd album for those reasons and a lot of others. But yeah, Animals. Yeah, and that band, where's my... Uh... I mean, this is kind of 
where it all starts, but not really starts, right? So so Dark Side of the Moon is is almost like literally the first album. And and this band period. I mean, this is the band that I think about uh that benefited the most from Ear Candy. I oh, think yeah. I think they're a massive band and they're super famous because of the ear candy, right? Well, hundred percent. And, yeah, and it started even thing. before, I mean, metal has yeah, a exactly. lot of it Yeah, It's little bits all over the place. Right. Uh, but dark side is, is where wow. it was really used. Uh, and, and it literally, <laughs> I think is 61% of the reason that album is as big as it is, is, is the ear candy all throughout it. That's, that's what turned songs like money into hits. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. My next choice is, um, Again, the maybe this is a good segue because this is the other band you kind of think about uh, for ear candy. Um, but uh, but it's it's again it's a it's more of a musical ear candy I'm I'm finding out. But Frank Zappa, you are what you is. We did a Contrarians episode where I called this my favorite Frank Zappa album, and it totally is. I'm I'm Mister Strictly Commercial. Give me the give me the funny hits. Give me the songs, uh, and I'm happy with Frank Zappa. I don't I, I don't need the classical stuff and the and the shut up and play your guitar series and all and that the fusion sort of noodly stuff, right? Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah, I I I just want hit me hit me fast with all those those cool little Frank Zappa hits. So, um, so yeah, you got Teenage Wind with the Grateful Dead pinched voice vocal thing, Free as the Wind, extra funny vocals. That's the, that's the thing. A lot of Frank Zappa ear candy, <clears throat> it goes back to what we said about the Peter Gabriel album, where it's utilizing different voices with Peter Gabriel. It's all his own voice uh, with little Kate Bush or whatever. But here it's uh, it's uh, Frank and and Ike and all these different guys who are who are throwing in that uh that that you know yuck it up fire sign theater national lampoon sort of feel you know the the crazy hippie from the early 70s rather than the late 60s right the you know that that sort of thing right um so so uh yeah big part of frank zappa ear candy is in the funny voices and frank himself with his different gears that he has um uh harder harder than your husband's got the sung like a truck driver voice doreen's got the high frankie valley voice goblin girls got the got the reggae and the weird drum sounds again uh drums in this band especially chad wackerman uh you you get a lot of funny little um drum sounds that are hooks or or ear candy in themselves um more ear candy than hooks i would say because it's more sounds right it's not it's not really oh what a what a cool little tidy you know easily accessible drum part sort of thing uh you got the monster music in there as well with the you know the old 60s monster music theme from the third is all weird chimey sounds odd beats society pages Funny vocals again. I'm a beautiful guy stopping for those weird sounds. So, uh, and, and runs and things. So yeah, the, the, you know, Zappa creates a lot of comedic, amusing music that sounds like it's a parody on jazz sort of thing, uh, which is amusing and, and ear candy in itself. Beauty knows no pain. Charlie's enormous mouth, funny lyrics and music. Funny lyrics, of course, is, is a thing. Uh, any downers, you get the high voice back. Cone heads, variety of vocals, you know, mud club. There's talking in the in, like in a club, like so you got sound effects, cyborg, cyborg voice from Frank, uh, which we get, you know, on um, we get the cyborg, of course, famously on Joe's Garage as well. Um, then the you know, saxophone, vocal grunts, little electronic drum sounds, meek shall inherit nothing, spoken word, Frank, dumb all over. Uh, the the whole, the Mexican I I thing going on in that one. Uh, Frank's uh, spooky voice again. So so again, Frank's got that close to the mic voice that he does, and 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 all you know various sounds, synth sounds. Uh, again, uh, oddly enough, I'm just noticing this, but it uh, it 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 behooves the keyboardist and synthesizer player to uh, to add spice to to a Frank Zappa melange, right? Um, Heavenly bank account. You got the evangelical thing, suicide chump, the don't do it. You know, the little high, the, the, the you know, the, the denigrating female voice that, uh, that is often done by a male in the Frank Zappa uh, band, a jumbo go away. The female voice thing there again, if only she would have, you got claps, you got the go to your left, right, left, right thing going on there. And then it, it all sort of, uh, you know, comes to a head with, uh, with drafted again. Um, where you've got the register mail, goddamn little communist, you know, not gonna, I know you're in there, that whole thing going on, right? Um, <clears throat> and you got the burping sound in there, the high voice kid, you got the come on down, uh, Price is Right thing in there, closing jam, and 
the whole shot in a foxhole, do, 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 that whole thing. So yeah, this this whole song. And again, it was a hit like Pink Floyd Money because it's full of ear candy, right? It's just yeah. it's just a laugh ride. It's funny start to finish sort of thing. And it's and it's full of all this uh, fun stuff. So yeah, Zappa, any fame that Zappa got pretty much was because of ear candy. God, we could again we could do a whole show just on all the weirdness and little things utilized yeah. on all these zap albums i can't remember more if it's that album <clears throat> there's another album that has kazoo on a bunch of songs so you'd be listening all of a sudden you're oh, yeah. Yeah. it's like what, what yeah you can go that through happened? all of it i mean valley girl his biggest hit is because of the ear candy of having moon unit on there talking valley talk you yeah. know and, and metal metal is used as ear candy on valley girl it's like oh this is frank zappa's metal song and yeah. that that goes to that whole thing of like you know we always talk about everybody loves metal they just won't admit it sort of thing and, and that, that was a perfect example of that his heaviest song is his biggest hit right yeah, that bass is like enormous on that song it's yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh frank 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 all right uh, my next pick is uh, Electric Light Orchestra, El Dorado from 1974, uh, partly because of, you know, I mean, obviously this band had their own little mini orchestra in the band. They had violin and cello players in the band. But how about record the album with a full orchestra, uh, which you hear right off the bat on the El Dorado overture that starts off the album, and along with like this spoken word narration which sounds like something out of like a 1930s you know movie or whatever uh and it's just you know for 1974 it was kind of not something all that common to hear rock band with orchestra type of thing so this is pretty cool uh can't get out of my head pure pop song loaded with strings loaded with moog from richard tandy that almost sound like raindrops and things uh boy blue you got horns and strings utilized to perfection uh you, on laredo to tornado you got rock guitar you got clavinet and the orchestra kind of a cool combination Poor boys got these big, huge choirs. Again, it sounds like something from like the 30s or the 40s. Uh, and then the title track has the big sweeping orchestra along with the choirs and the rock elements. And you got guitars and things. It's just like this collision of all these elements that shouldn't work, but work really well because they just, they kind of perk your interest, perk your ear up. So yeah, El Dorado by ELO. Nice, nice. All right, my final <laughs> choice. Um Aerosmith Permanent Vacation. What I liked about this choice, it is, is literally is one of the first albums I thought of when, when this concept came up. Because what I like about this choice is that um, the album just before it, Done With Mirrors, is famously sort of thought of as their most stripped down, non-ear candy sort of album. This isn't really an ear candy band anyways, but there is there are little bits of ear candy all over the place. You think of Joni's Butterfly. Walk This Way is just ear candy start to finish just in the way it's put together. It's just so irresistibly uh, interesting. Um, you know, it's a combination of hookiness and ear candy. But what I like about this is that this is your go to Vancouver and try harder sort of album where you go, wow, Aerosmith's really trying to trying to please their fan base. They're paying attention to us. You know, the bad things we know about Aerosmith is being kind of dicks. Um, you know, it's like, oh, they're actually trying to please the audience on this one, which is kind of neat. And that's what the ear candy represents here. And they were famously rewarded for it because it was a massive, uh, huge, huge multi-platinum album and pump was even bigger and, uh, you know, or was it bigger? I don't know, whatever that, but you know, and even bigger was get a grip. So, so they had, they had these massive albums all in a row. And I think it really i think uh really some of the credit to aerosmith's uh massive uh return to prominence comes from ear candy um and this album you've got hearts done time big heavy song of theirs but it starts off with all those whale sounds so you're instantly taken to vancouver it sounds like uh you know the whatever that the thing is called on stanley park um the the zoo that they have they're famous for the orcas and all that but it, yeah so you get these whale sounds kicking it off and you go oh that's different for aerosmith they are trying harder right uh ragdoll's got the the percussion the the hip hoppy sort of thing the slidey guitar sounds so that's the thing about joe perry that he starts to get into he um one of his life philosophies is if i'm going to play a guitar solo or a guitar part I'm going to use some weird sounds. I'm going to make it sound different. I want to sound kind of unusual. And, and he really starts picking it up on this album. Um, 
You've got horns. So again, trying harder. Um, you've got a, the rappy vocal. You've got the scatting at the end. You've got clarinet coming in. So it's like a, a little bit like uh, the Van Halen's dad bringing clarinet in sort of thing. Um, that that kind of idea. So you're thinking, oh, interesting instruments. Uh, Simurai, you've got shakers. So, uh, you know, we know this is something Aerosmith overdoes over time where they where they make the percussion sound like not a drum part anymore by introducing all these weird things and not having hi-hat and and regular sounds and everything being kind of over over processed but um, what they are trying to do with that is is add an ear candy element to the uh to the percussion uh you know melange of tracks that they've got here and so yeah we've got shakers in this one uh dude you've got that repeating sound at the beginning to kick it off which is kind of like a a hip-hop trope it's a it's a little bit of a scratching trope um to kick off the sound so instantly ear candy uh, you've got clavinet in this one as well you've got horns um saint john you've got that jazzy sort of intro so again the tubes thing of mixing up different kinds of musics you got finger snaps in it hang hangman jury jury hangman jury um uh, totally or candy because it starts off with the sitting on the porch thing with the rocking chair and the creaking and then it's like the the uh, the vocal is like a hillbilly sort of vocal from him with a with a lack of you know track a lack of low boy won't you lie on the track a lack of that whole thing right you got the steely guitar harmonica uh, is an ear candy kind of instrument um get this sort of dancing percussion sound it ends the same way as it starts um so yeah this is a, a song all about ear candy girl keeps coming apart you've got the blues brother sort of thing uh you know it's almost like a quote from the blues brother maybe it actually is um but but it makes you think of that immediately so that's total ear candy horns harmonica Angel hate the song to death, but it's got strings in it. So they're again, trying harder. You know, you're thinking Aerosmith's being nice to me as a, as a purchaser of their albums. They've, they've got a string section going on, right? Permanent vacation, total ear candy, monkey sounds, right? The steel drums. Um, love this song. What an amazing riff, right? It's just such a, such a cool song. Um, you've got the jet plane sound in it. You've got the, the Caribbean music jam at the end. Um, Putting in a short Beatles cover is a type of ear candy itself. So they've got I'm down on here. Um, so that's ear candy. Uh, and then you've got the movie, uh, which is an instrumental with sound effects, interesting audio stuff going on. There's this little bit of Japanese talking thing going on. Uh, so that takes us back to the tubes and it takes us back to David Bowie's Scary Monsters uh, in, in there as well. So so lots of it start to finish. And again, uh, it just makes for this interesting album where you think Aerosmith's a lot more upscale than we thought they were on on Done With Mirrors. I, and I want to touch on your comment about Joe Perry uh, around this time, starting to starting to use lots of different things to make to on his solos to make them sound a little more unique, uh, like slide and, and utilizing you know different uh, picking techniques and things. I I, have, I sometimes wonder, Martin, because early on there was this always kind of like, well, who's playing the solos? Is it is it Whitford or is it Perry? But yeah, Perry's the guy who always got, I think, all the credit from the fans as being the guitar player in the band. And I'm, I've read interviews with Brad, who was always like, ah, oh, people always talk about Joe Perry's solos, but they're all mine, right? You know, like I'm the better player in the band. So you wonder if Joe around this time wanted to do some different things to differentiate the sound mm -hmm. of the both of them, yeah. so that you could tell exactly who's playing what on these albums i don't know yeah yeah and it's also these big producers right i uh, i mean you know producers love doing all this stuff as well um you know and john kolodner and, and all this like there's just a massive machine around aerosmith yeah. so uh and i think everybody in that machine knows the value of ear candy because like i say it goes back to dark side of the moon dark side of the well even beatles before that but there 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 is this you know this, this truism i guess that that ear candy can sell records yeah it certainly can uh and i'm guessing on this next one that maybe didn't work out as well as the band wanted to because they released three fairly straightforward great sounding albums and then they put out an album full of ear candy that i think kind of surprised the listeners a little bit um but listening to it all these years later it's a masterpiece because of the ear candy and that's caravan sarai from santana 
from 1972, their fourth album. So they have the three really, really big albums that came before that are, you know, more vocal oriented, right? Latin, rock and jazz and whatnot. And then they put out this mostly instrumental album of really dreamy, atmospheric jazz fusion. And Latin rock, uh, I mean, it opens up with crickets, right? And then you got the, the sax sounding like it's coming from far away. You got the chimes and all the Latin percussion, the volume swells and the keyboards on Eternal Caravan of Reincarnation just kind of sweeps you away, pulls you into the album. It's very, very different. Um, and, you know, right off the bat, you know that this album is less song based and more into kind of mood moving music, right? You got this kind of spiritualness, this heavy feeling of jazz and jazz fusion because of course carlos is listening to like coltrane and miles davis and all these guys really heavily around this time uh you got you know carlos and neil sean's soaring guitars over the organ the percussion on waves within you got the hammond organ on just in time to see the sun when paired with the percussion gives this impression of like the early morning right um you got the swirling organ and guitars on song of the wind gives the impression of a soft breeze and they utilize all these instruments throughout this entire album to you know give you this impression of nature and you know spiritual thought process is very tied to what's going on in nature so it totally makes sense and the more you know about carlos santana where he was from uh from that perspective in his life you know that this album totally made sense based on all his beliefs and what he was getting into and the music he was listening to and i think this is a remarkable remarkable headphone album that again i hadn't listened to on headphones in quite a while and i was just amazed at some of the things i was hearing again utilizing different types of keyboards and percussion and chimes and things like that and guitars layering guitars using effects on guitars to create this kind of wonderful ear candy that just again puts you out in nature which i think is really cool i mean i have a couple of these on my list that are like that and this totally is one of them caravans arrived from santana nice very cool all right well i didn't really have much for honorable mentions i mean i i did want to quickly mention rush 2112 alice cooper welcome to my nightmare and oh, pink floyd the wall we could have gone through that and found tons of tons of it as well but but again yeah. they are they are literally the number one band who has benefited from your candy oh yeah yeah I, I had a few uh rush ones on my list too i had 2112 i think a farewell of kings is loaded with it you can make the argument for moving pictures as well i mean i think they have a lot of cool ear candy sprinkled on a lot of those albums post 2112 up until signals i think but uh yeah great side yeah we can go on and on with this topic it's uh, pretty interesting so cool martin uh what's uh what's going on as we finish out the year on the contrarians and uh books and podcast and all that yeah contrarians is still you know continuing to post and we'll have the album cover show back next week we skipped a week and i, I my last uh, episode of the audio podcast history in five songs i think it was 235 it was called first gear singers before that was they shrunk the boogie so that's out all the time you can see that all over the place and uh yeah the books is my my slowest month of the year uh always uh january is and i also did what i call my lifetime supply buy of some of these books so the kiss the pink floyd and the who i've got more in that i probably won't need to order for a long time i, I get to the point when sales start dwindling of some of these books where it's like um okay well i really overbought this time that this definitely is my lifetime supply like i won't be needing any more for a long time so prove me wrong in this in this uh slow month get some books from me uh martinpopoff.com yeah the the pink floyd the who the the, the bluish occult still continues to sell well the the panel book uh dominance and submission and that's all uh, martinpopoff.com cool so use some of that uh, leftover Christmas money, folks. Head on over to martinpopoff.com and get yourself some some good reading. So you can, just like Martin, read five or six books at a time and just load up your bookshelves, right? That's what it's all about. So cool. Uh, let's see, what do we got going on here? We've got um, Scott Lade from the Prague Corner is joining me today. We will be doing a kind of like wrap up the year in Prague, what we saw, what some of the trends were and what our thoughts are on going into 2024. That'll be coming up tonight. Uh, we've got um, UK Connection coming up tomorrow. Again, wrapping up the year, some of our favorite and picks of the year and least favorite things that happened this year. And uh, then on Sunday, Grant Arthur and I will be ranking our top 10 favorite Todd Rundgren solo albums. And uh, that will basically be our last show on oh, no, Sunday night. 
uh, George Lemie, Stephen Reed, and myself will be uh, announcing the uh, Sea of Tranquility Awards from 2023. So what were your favorite episodes across a lot of the different shows on the channel? Uh, Martin, you have any guess which is the uh, which will be the favorite Friday morning the Funhouse show this year? Man, this year. See, that's the thing. I, I, uh, oh boy, who knows? I, I, I'm no, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. I don't even know what we've done. And, and, and just like when we're trying to pick albums of the year, right? It always bleeds into, you always go and you go, oh, yeah, that one, that one. You go, darn, that was October of 2022, right? Kind of thing, right? So, uh, no idea. We'll, no leave, idea. we'll leave it up to the gods. <laughs> okay. You will be uh, you'll be surprised I, because we've already got the uh, the picks uh, from everybody. And uh, I was surprised that the one that was the number one most voted for this show. Um, it's, it's a really good one. But I was just, you know, I thought it might be others. But, uh, you know, you never can tell what really resonates with people. So, uh, but yeah, we'll be announcing all the picks across all the shows on the channel uh, on Sunday evening. So stay tuned for that. And uh, Happy New Year, everybody. This is on the web at www.seatertranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together all the damn time. Please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell so you get alerted of all of our content as it posts. And please do hit the like button before you leave. If you uh, care to assist the channel, we get the links to our Ko-Fi page, our merch page, and our Cameo page all listed down below. Somewhere down there below Martin and I. And uh, thanks in advance. And uh, again, Happy New Year from Martin and myself. Uh, we'll see you next time here at the Funhouse. Take care. Bye-bye.